This is Food Chemistry Unit 2, Chapter 23, Mixtures, Solutions, Colloidal Dispersions, and Suspensions. So I went to Chapter 23 because it also talks about solutions, which I just mentioned in our um, previous video or topic. So I'm just kind of connecting this because I'm um, still talking about solutions. So foods are generally mixtures of elements and compounds, right? Foods are classified by the size of the particles distributed throughout the mixture. So let's look at a little bit more detail now about solutions. So they have two parts. You have the solute, which is what is dissolved or dispersed in the mixture. This is the dispersed phase. You have the solvent, what does the dissolving or the continuous phase. Now you can actually have different types of solute solvent combinations, right? You can have a solid solute in a liquid. This would be sugar and water to make Kool-Aid, right? This packet would get dissolved in water. Um, and there you go, there's your Kool-Aid solution. How about liquid and liquid? This would be like chocolate sauce, that would be the solute in milk, which would be the solvent, and that's how you get your chocolate milk, right? Liquid and liquid, good stuff. All right, now gas in liquid would be your carbon dioxide and water, um, which is soda, right? But soda actually involves um, combinations of states, right? You have corn syrup, that's a liquid, sugar, is a solid, carbon dioxide is a gas. So you actually have all three states in one delicious product. Yes, Dr. Pepper is the best soda. End of story. Now there are factors affecting solubility. So what do I mean by solubility? This is the ability of a solute to dissolve in a solvent. So when you're trying to dissolve something, right? Um, how well it dissolves is a measure of solubility. And there are factors that affect this. The first factor is temperature. So the higher the temperature, the higher the solubility for solids, not gases. So temperature is a measure of kinetic energy and kinetic energy or the movement of molecules is faster at higher temperatures. Solids have more collisions and dissolve faster. Gases move faster, but escape from solution faster. Now in the candy industry, water can hold more sugar at higher temperatures, and this affects the concentration and sweetness of candy. We'll talk about the different types in just a second, types of candy that is. Now soft drinks will lose their carbonation, right? The gas will come out of solution faster at room temperature than if it is chilled. Particle size. Um, the particle size of a solute will affect its degree of solubility. Smaller particles have a greater surface area um, exposed, right? So sugar cubes, right? This tight cube right here would take longer to dissolve than that spoonful of sugar because there's a greater surface area in that spoonful. More of it is exposed to the um, solvent. Concentration. This is a measure of the amount of solute that there is in solvent. And there's three different types of solutions where you can um, navigate this concentration. You have your unsaturated solution. This is a solution that can dissolve more solute. You can add more and it'll continue to dissolve. Saturated, a saturated solution um, holds all of the solute that will dissolve in a solvent. If you try to add more, it settles. A good example of this is chocolate milk. If you add too much syrup, not that that tastes bad, but if the milk cannot hold anymore, it settles to the bottom. Super saturated solutions. Um, these are solutions that hold more solute when heated. When cooled, the solution has a higher concentration than normal and crystals will form. And candy makers rely on super saturated solutions um, for different types of candy. And it depends on that sugar to water ratio. So if you want large masses of crystals, that's your rock candy. So you want a lot of sugar um, and not a lot of water. It's usually like a two to one ratio, um, but it depends. Um, fudge, these are smaller crystals separated by interfering agents. The, that would be things like, you know, like cream or butter, things like that, whereas rock candy is just sugar and water. Now, hard candy, like your candy canes and lollipops, right? Hence the name hard candy. There's less than 2% water. Chewy candy, like your caramels or gums, 
This has 8 to 15% water, depending on the type of candy that you'd like to make. Um, candy making, um, it's, it's pretty tough. Um, it's neat to try, but you have to be very careful about that sugar to water ratio um, and also the temperature. pH. Um, pH usually is referring to like an acid base, right? So I don't know if you remember that from chemistry class, um, but pH is altered by increasing or decreasing. Here you go, acids, bases, or salts. Agitation or stirring increases the speed of solubility, which really increases the kinetic energy. Now, vapor pressure. Um, this was taught in chemistry class. So let's just take a look at this and how it relates to food. Um, vapor pressure is the pressure at which gases escape from and dissolve into a liquid at the same time. So they're coming out of a liquid and going back in. Um, it's called vapor pressure. Um, the best place to see this is soda. You have that CO2 or carbon dioxide gas added to a liquid under pressure, and then those beverages are placed in sealed containers. So when they're in that sealed container, um, the gas is at equilibrium, the gas over the liquid and the gas in the liquid. There's not much over the liquid because they're in that can and there's um, not too many places for it to escape from, right? But as soon as you open that um, bottle or can, right, um, the equilibrium, equilibrium is broken and the balance of pressure changes. You know that, right? When you open a can of soda or twist off the top of a like two liter bottle, it makes that sound, right? Um, so that equilibrium has changed. That's the CO2 coming out. So the pressure over the liquid is reduced because gases dissolved in that liquid bubble out of the liquid. This is also why root beer foams so much, right? There's a really rapid change in vapor pressure when that bottle is opened, and it's uh, much foamier than other types of soda, uh, but it really has to do with the plant where it's coming from. It's coming from what's called a sassafras root and bark, and these properties are a little bit different um, compared to um, some of the ingredients in your um, other known, well-known sodas like Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, things like that. Root beer um, is very particular. It's coming from sassafras root, okay? And it's one of the oldest sodas. Okay, so now we jump back to chapter four, which again, looks at basic food chemistry, the nature of matter. So we looked at matter itself, what it's made of, right? Um, now we're going to look at some changes. Um, there's two basic types. There's physical and chemical. Again, might sound familiar from chemistry class, but we're going to go over it anyway. So let's look at physical changes. Um, a physical change is a change involving the shape, size, temperature, or physical state of the substance, like solid liquid gas, um, without changing the chemical identity. So when you freeze water to make ice cubes, you still have water. They're just solids now. If you crush ice, you just change the shape of the ice. It's still water. If you chop an onion, it's still an onion, just in smaller pieces. If you dissolve salt in water, you still have salt. You still have water. It's just dispersed, right, or distributed. You didn't make anything new. You still have the same substances, just in a different form. Now, this often involves a phase change, which is a shift from one phase or state of matter to another, and your states of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. So the visible structure changes, but not the chemical structure. So let's review your three states of matter and the changes. So the three states of matter are your solid, liquid, and gas. So solids, remember, have a definite shape and volume. This would be like salt, NaCl, or ice cubes. When heated, atoms will move apart as they gain energy, and when that structure is lost, they become liquids. Liquids, no definite shape, but the volume can be measured in a graduated cylinder. Atoms will flow or slide past one another and take the shape of the container, such as milk, water, or juice. When heated, atoms gain energy and escape into the air and become a gas and gases have no definite shape or volume. They expand to fit any closed container. Now, phase changes have names. So this, again, might look familiar to you, but in the food industry, it should make a little bit more sense, right? Freezing, if you wanna make ice cubes, liquid water to solid water. Melting butter right in a pan, solid butter becomes a liquid when you heat it. 
boiling or evaporating, like heating up water for pasta, the liquid will turn to a gas. That's the um, steam coming off, right? And then condensation would be gas um, turning back down to a liquid. So if you've ever, ever had um, like cans of soda in the fridge and then you pull them out and you start to see that perspiration on the can, that's condensation. Chemical changes. Here, new substances with different chemical and physical properties are formed. Evidence of a chemical change includes color, odor, flavor, or release of gas. A pretty common chemical change in the food industry is fermentation. Now, this defini definition has some words that um, may look familiar from biology class, but um, it's been a while, and yes, we'll go through them. But here's the definition. It's a metabolic process uh, that produces chemical changes in organic substrates through the action of enzymes. So enzymes are proteins, and they have to work with um, substrates, some very specific ones, in order to function. Um, we will talk about that in later chapters. But right now, maybe you've heard of fermentation with yeast, and we will talk about this. So yeast can undergo changes to make things like bread, alcohol, or cheeses. So it's very common in the food industry. All right, now digestion is a combination of both. It involves physical and chemical changes. So what is digestion, right? It's breaking down food into substances the cells of your body can use. Mechanical digestion, this is physically breaking down your food. Um, when you chew in the mouth, right, and then you swallow, and then you have muscle contractions in your throat, in your stomach, in your intestines, that's all physically breaking down the food. Then you have chemical digestion, where your body uses enzymes, acids, and other liquids to separate food into nutrients. Those nutrients are moved to different systems in the body, like the circulatory, which is your heart, right, respiratory, which is your lungs. So when those nutrients are pulled out of the food and used, they can't go back into the food, right? So that's chemical digestion. So um, both processes, both changes are used in digestion. All right, so here's some examples now um, with food of physical versus chemical changes. I love this picture. Um, it's a great example to show you the difference between a physical or a chemical change for bread. If you heat bread, just heat the bread itself, maybe like in an oven, that bread will lose some water and gets warmer, right? But the bread is still bread. So that's a physical change. Maybe it might get a little bit tougher here, but if you actually let it sit and cool down, it'll absorb the water back, and you can get that bread back to the way it was. Now, if you toast the bread, see that browning that occurs? It's called the Malliard reaction. We'll talk about that later. Now the color of the bread has changed. The flavor of the bread has changed. So the starch and the bread underwent a chemical or permanent change. You can't untoast this and get the bread back the way, the way it was. So physical, chemical. And this is another great video. If you want to see some more examples of physical chemical changes, I will post it. All right, how about CO2, carbon dioxide? You hear it and see bubbles when you open a can of soda. This, I know it looks like some big chemical reaction. It's not. This is a physical change because the CO2 has just been physically separated from the water. You have nothing new, it just came out of the liquid phase. All right, when you bake though, right? So here you've got the batter, right? And then you make muffins. To this batter, you often add baking soda. You might add um, an acid, maybe um, like cream of tartar. Um, you add these ingredients to make muffins, right? Why do you add these, right? Um, CO2 will form bubbles in the batter. This is a chemical change since it is the result of mixing two different substances. When you add those ingredients and then get those bubbles, you just make something new. And you can't undo that, right? And then when you bake it, why do you actually do that in the baking industry? So you get these little holes in here and it makes the um, dough fluffier and lighter, right? And the cooking of foods, right? Actual baking or cooking of foods, most of this is chemical like pancakes on a griddle as soon as you make the pancakes you can't go back to the batter stage scrambled eggs you can't get back to the liquid and that liquid egg and then back in the shell and then reseal the shell that's just not going to happen frying chicken right you can't go back to the raw stage of the meat so these are all chemical changes